everyone. I am Dr. Deepak Talwar. I am Secretary, Indian Chess Society, and I am a pulmonologist working at NOIDA, Metro Center for Respiratory Diseases. There is an association between API and ICS to provide respiratory updates to physicians, and it has formed a body called EPIX. EPIX webinars are coming your way. And considering the high interest and emphasis on the lung health in the current times, this is going to be a monthly series. Twice a month, it will be coming on two Saturdays and it aims at providing a complete update on advances and diagnosis of management of some of the respiratory diseases which are of importance to our physicians as well as respiratory physicians. This will be based on case-based discussions and what we routinely encounter in our daily practice. So this webinar is going to be a great way to help us enhance our knowledge to treat our patients. And of course, this seminar is aimed at not only physicians, but also respiratory physicians and hence we'll have mix of physicians as well as respiratory physicians discussing it on the table and giving the messages which can be implemented in our daily practice. So do join in for this EPIX webinar, which is going to be on 11th March, 8 p.m. onwards. And the knowledge partner for this is Glenmark. Hello everyone. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you all on this API ICS Respiratory Update online series. API and Indian Chess Society have joined hands to pursue the common goal to update the knowledge of respiratory physicians and practicing physicians in the field of respiratory medicine. There, be, there has been a spurt recently in respiratory cases and post-COVID complications and a need was felt to update the knowledge of practicing physicians at a grassroots level. And I hope this online series of respiratory update will go a long way in achieving this goal. We'll organize these programs at a regular basis at a, as a case-based discussion and we'll invite distinguished faculties to share their knowledge and skill. I compliment and congratulate Dr. Deepak Talwar, Secretary, Indian Chess Society, Dr. Jyotirmay Paul, Dean, Indian College of Physicians, and Dr. Agam Vora, Secretary API for taking this wonderful initiative. I welcome you all again this evening and extend my best wishes for this program. Welcome all the delegates. I am Professor Dr. Jyotin Mai Pal, Dean Indian College of Physicians, that is the academic wing of Association of Physicians of India. I welcome all the physicians and students to this joint symposium of Association of Physicians of India and Indian Chess Society. It is my intention to enable different associations to come together and organize such collaborative endeavors for the advancement of knowledge and mutual exchange of wisdom that will ultimately lead to upliftment of standard of medical care. Hope this joint symposium of Association of Physicians of India and Indian Chess Society will update our members on the recent advances on respiratory medicine. Jai Hind, Bande Mataram, Long Live API, Long Live Association of Chess Society. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, welcome to today's uh, session on of uh, EPICS, uh, which involves uh, diagnosis of community-acquired pneumonia in the outpatient settings. So, we have an interesting panel today, uh, which will uh, uh, which will be uh, uh, you know uh, discussed by uh, uh, two eminent uh, physicians, and uh, the session will be chaired by Dr. Vijay Kumar, sir. Uh, he is from the Hyderabad Chess Center. Uh, we have two eminent uh, panelists uh, who will, uh, who, I mean, the discussants who, who will be answering our questions with regards to the various, uh, 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 with regards to the presentation which is being uh, showed. Uh, so we will have uh, Dr. Mehul Shah. Uh, he is a pulmonologist uh, uh, and a consultant at uh, Safi and Bhatia Hospital from uh, Mumbai. And uh, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, he is a critical care physician uh, from Nair Hospital. So we have a mix of both public sector as well as private sector. And uh, to guide us through the, uh, to take us through the cases, uh, we have uh, two uh, presenters. Uh, the case first will be presented by uh, Dr. Apurva Agarwal. She is a senior resident in the Department of Medicine at Bombay Hospital. 
And the second case would be uh, presented by Dr. Tanya Atavle. She is a DM uh, pulmonary medicine resident at uh, KEM Hospital, which also happens to be my alma mater of uh, for MD pulmonary medicine. So, uh, so welcome uh, all the uh, welcome chairperson sir and uh, all the discussions and the uh, uh, presenters. So, without wasting much time, uh, I would like to move ahead uh, with the first case to be presented by Dr. Apurva. Over to you. Uh, a very good evening to one and all. I'll just share my screen. Uh, case one is on community acquired pneumonia in outpatient settings. Uh, is it visible to everyone? I can't see it because. Yeah, now it is. Oh. I can't see it now. Oh, no. Now I can yeah. see it. Okay. Uh, a 67-year-old gentleman, Mr. DK, retired government official, presented to the clinic with chief complaints of fever with chills since five days, cough with scant expectoration since three days, now increased coughing and production of mucopurulent secretions, and he noticed some streaks of blood in the early morning expectorated phlegm, pain on taking deep breaths on the right side of the chest since two days, and increasing shortness of breath since two days on daily activities. In past medical history, he is a known case of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and hypothyroidism, occasional alcohol intake. He is currently taking telmisartan, amlodipine, rosuvastatin, and levothyroxine. There is a history of drug-induced diarrhea to amoxicillin one year back when prescribed for acute dental infections. On physical examination, the pulse is 110 beats per minute. Respiratory rate is 27 breaths per minute. He is febrile, temperature is 102.1 degrees Fahrenheit, BP 150-94 and saturation 94% on room air. He is conscious oriented, he is obese. On respiratory system examination, he is tachypneic. There is an impaired percussion note on the right side, bronchial breath sounds on the right side. In cardiovascular system examination, uh, he is tachycardic with 110 beats per minute. There are no murmurs or gallop rhythms. And per abdo examination is soft mildly distended, bowel sounds are heard. So how to suspect pneumonia and when to order chest x-ray in OPD? Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the case presented to us is an elderly gentleman with multiple comorbidities who has an acute history of cough and uh, fever and uh, is tachycardic and tachypneic. Uh, so he walks into your OPD. So I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Mehul Shah, so if uh, such patient comes to your OPD, so what clinical findings or what will lead you to suspect that he might be suffering from pneumonia, A. And second, uh, what tests, like what radiological tests, like an X-ray, uh, would you be, how frequently would you be doing it in an outpatient settings or would you just rely on clinical findings to, uh, you know, diagnose him as a pneumonia? Dr. Mehul Shah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Aryan. So, two things. Uh on the suspicion part of the pneumonia, uh, in fact, the history over here has been very well put in the classical signs and everything which is there. So typically a short history, uh, which is progressing and progressing very rapidly where he started having mucopurulent expectoration after a couple of days and uh, typically a localizing symptom and signs. So we had this pain which has been going on, which was a new onset since around two days. And on examination also, there were these localizing findings where they found impaired note also and the bronchial bed sound. So typically everything is pointing towards a localized finding, which then makes the pneumonia suspicion very likely in view of this history, but more importantly, the findings also as for the patient as well as on the physical examination. So that pretty much makes us suspect the history of pneumonia over here. When I would do an x-ray would also be to actually confirm this finding and also be sure that there is only this and nothing else which is developing. So sometimes we can have, along with pneumonia, some effusion which is developing. So that's where the X-ray would help us as a baseline so that we can keep a track of what really needs to be resolved. And uh, subsequently would probably take a call on repeating the X-ray depending on his status over next uh, three to four days, depending on the resolution of symptoms and how is he doing clinically. And then take a call on uh, seeing the X-ray. 
in our setting i would normally repeat an x-ray uh, though it's not always recommended but i would rather err on repeating the x-ray and seeing the trend we no may not see the complete resolution but at least the trend has to be on a resolving one so that is where i would do an x-ray so maybe after 7 to 10 days uh, would uh, be an idea from my side to repeat an x-ray okay so that's very uh, uh, precise and uh, well put so if we can just uh, move ahead the slide uh, dr apurva so yes. as you pointed out uh, the clinical history uh, if you can see the bts guidelines on community acquired pneumonia they very much point towards uh, pneumonia which uh, so in this case it's a community acquired pneumonia because it's uh, outside of hospital settings so you need both clinical and radiology radiology maybe uh, you know to support as you said that you confirm whether it's number one or uh, pneumonia second whether it's complicated with some other features like uh, you know a paranimonic effusion or anything which obviously has an implication in uh, diagnosis because sometimes you might have an empyema which is also brewing in so considering uh, the patient is a diabetic so such uh, things also need to be taken care of along with uh, treat, uh, pneumonia, uh, treating the pneumonia and obviously you have a baseline uh, chest x ray or a radiology which you can very well use it for uh, assessing the treatment response so yeah so community acquired pneumonia requires both clinical and a radiology to be just sure of the diagnosis so uh, uh, yeah <clears throat> yes sir dr hariharan i would like to just put two points yeah number one uh, the history is so clear cut with fever and chills mm -hmm. um which in which indicates an infection with a bacteria most likely yeah and uh, importantly the chest pain indicates that the pleura is involved normally True. when the lung is involved there is no pain at all when the pleura is involved there is a chest pain uh, on coughing on breathing etc so that means uh, there is a low bar involvement and as far as the chest x ray is concerned i think i would do it as a first investigation without giving a second thought so sure. and i think in the entire algorithm starts with a chest x ray yeah that that yeah, that's absolutely right uh, the chest x ray is a must uh, so uh, moving ahead so uh, just the take home points clinically localized symptoms short history uh, with uh, suggestive features like cough with expectoration and shortness of breath with a radiological uh, evidence of a new shadow for which there is no alternative explanation so uh, move on uh, dr apurva yes sir. Uh, so in whom should we suspect community acquired pneumonia and order chest x ray patient with risk factors such as age extremes of age less than 5 years more than 65 years immunosuppressed like patients with cancer hiv aids or on immunosuppressants patients with autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis etc chronic lung conditions such as copd bronchitis interstitial lung diseases etc alcoholism smoking or patients with poor morbidities involving the heart liver or kidney this is the chest x ray of a patient which shows a non homogeneous opacity in the right lower zone suggestive of consolidation okay so uh, just before you uh, move ahead i would just uh, like uh, dr rakesh uh, uh, to opine uh, do you feel that uh, the pattern of opacity on the chest x ray can give a clue as to what could be the uh, underlying etiology like a virus or bacteria i mean you know whether you could sway your impression towards uh, uh, identifying any organism dr akesh uh, if you could uh, yeah i totally agree with the other panelists that x ray would be the ideal uh, investigation to be done as soon as we see such patients uh, localization unilateralism favors more in favor of uh, bacterial rather than uh, viral pneumonia Yeah. heterogeneities bilateral involvement are more commonly seen in viral uh, um, uh, pulmonary involvements rather than uh, bacterial having said that this cannot be a rule always uh, we have seen tuberculosis which will present uh, bilaterally as well uh, repeat uh, recurrent tuberculosis and in fact some uh, uh, what we say uh, influenza viruses we have seen x rays or Uh, for that matter even in covid we have seen x rays which have presented with unilateral shadows uh, in our institute as well so by and large i would say yes unilateralism and uh, lobar involvement 
will favor bacteria rather than viral infections true yeah that is uh, that, that is exactly what i uh, uh, i also feel and this is very important for the pgs as well that if you have a unilateral shadow uh, not a thumb rule but uh, not, i mean not a generalized rule but uh, more favors a bacterial although bilateral uh, and uh, you know uh, multi lobar can go in favor of uh, sometimes virus and other typical organisms as well okay so moving ahead so we have a question i think yes sir uh how important is community acquired pneumonia in india and why okay so uh, to answer this uh, question i would want uh, uh, opinion of uh, all both the panelists uh, because one represents a private sector practice if i'm not wrong and one is uh, on the government setup so uh, dr mayul if you could just start uh, uh, how frequently do you feel or what uh, is the prevalence or incidence of pneumonia or the burden of pneumonia in your clinical practice and uh, overall in indian context and uh, uh, then dr rakesh can pitch in with uh, what is see he does he see in the government setting whether is there any difference dr mayul if you could yeah so the burden is definitely as has been pointed out in the slide also and the burden definitely is there on the higher side uh, mm-hmm. I don't think it's difference between the private sector or the public sector over here. The burden is definitely there. In then outpatient settings, a lot of times now, uh, the numbers get underreported also because they are empirically started on antibiotics. So we are not typically documenting sometimes the X-rays, and so in a lower setup, they might just be initially initiated on antibiotics. So a lot of times we feel the numbers could be actually underreported on the outpatient settings. of course when the patient is hospitalized we see uh, the x rays and everything and of course they are very classical for pneumonia a lot of times so yes the burden is there on the high side and especially in the healthcare setup when we uh, see these patients hospitalized patients the ones who are already there in the hospital a little different from the current context of cap but uh, we also see a lot of hospital acquired pneumonias and everything also being there like aspiration related and everything so overall the pneumonia burden is huge in our country but i still feel in outpatient settings a lot of these community acquired pneumonias are still getting underreported so what is probably coming out the numbers it is maybe much higher than what we are reporting <clears throat> dr rakesh if you would uh, want to add something yes uh, uh, number are definitely correlating with whatever has been presented by various studies uh, both in private as well as in public sector but uh, we often see patients who have uh, more of uh, social uh, social related issues like alcoholism smoking tuberculosis you know uh, in form of in the form of lower strata of economic uh, status and our in in a public hospital the uh, uh, lower respiratory tract infection presentation is more in favor of tuberculosis rather than bacterial uh, Uh, other bacterial organisms which are commonly mentioned in various textbooks but yes we do see uh, bacterial viral atypical as well but percentage wise i would say we are more uh, into both pulmonary and as well as extra pulmonary tuberculosis uh, presentation in the big sector uh, at at present true hmm. so that is a, 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 a the tuberculosis causing cap is also a significant burden i mean i would say and uh, <clears throat> the important point with dr mayul made was uh, with uh, you know uh, uh, easy access to lot of over the counter antibiotics a lot of these patients might actually uh, you know not present to you and the numbers would actually be more than what is estimated and uh, uh, you know lack of community based studies makes it actually difficult to estimate the true inst- extent of cap across india Okay, so moving ahead, uh, Dr. Hariharan, can I make a point? Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Yeah, demographically, all of us who are sitting here in this platform are from the metros and the tier one cities. So what we see, either in the private or in the government, uh, the pneumonias which come in the outpatient time uh, is what is represented in the slide. But then a majority of the cases. who are being uh, seen and treated in tier 2 tier 3 cities and in the towns and villages they represent 70% of the population and in most of the cases a chest x ray is not done but an antibiotic is given so we do not know whether it was a pneumonia or not so in that way probably what we see is an underestimation 
maybe there are even more cases of pneumonia than which are documented so sure. yeah that is true sir okay. and by definition uh, community acquired pneumonia uh, excludes tuberculosis and probably in a non resolving pneumonia uh, tuberculosis can come as a differential diagnosis yeah okay so moving ahead uh... so how do okay. we decide to admit a patient or to treat uh, on opd basis so that's a very important clinical uh, uh, question uh, uh, along the discourse of discussion again i would want opinion of uh, 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 all the three uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists so first uh, starting with dr mehul so uh, you represent a uh, i think a private setup so what would be your uh, threshold of admitting a patient uh, uh, in uh, for who has presented with uh, or who has you know suspected or confirmed community acquired pneumonia and uh, do you use any of these uh, various uh, you know cut off uh, various uh, criteria which are shown on the screen uh, in deciding the admitting uh, deciding whether the patient needs admission or can be managed on an outpatient setting so dr mehul so a lot of time i would say the group of patients would be in two halves so one half is someone who just comes with the symptoms and probably they just land up doing an x-ray and comes to us with the x-ray so we really don't have any blood investigations or anything to judge so that time the decision is purely based on a uh, the clinical presentation itself and where we then the typical the crb 65 comes into the picture and as we've already seen so higher the age or any significant comorbidities and a uh, a respiratory distress kind of picture or cardio respiratory distress where we had a uh, blood pressure which is on the lower side or the heart rate uh, respiratory rate which is on the higher side so those turn out to be the ones which we would be inclined to get hospitalized however this is not the only criteria we also check that what is their background and whether they are going to be someone who are going to be compliant with medications or being able to follow up after 48 hours which is very crucial to keep a watch upon for the next 48 hours even if you have decided to uh treat this patient on an outpatient basis so all these criteria is not only the crp 65 but other these factors also come into the picture when we take a call on hospitalization the other half is the one who actually come with blood investigations so of course very deranged blood investigations where we see the counts are very high or very low the platelets uh the other parameters like creatinine and everything so all those again come into the picture on taking a decision regarding the Uh, the admission criteria so it's not mean, only multi organ dysfunction where where multi organ involvement that's yeah, right that, that is right so dr rakesh uh, if uh, you have a different uh, set of challenge because uh, i understand uh, that uh, you know uh, there is a lot of bed crunch uh, so uh, do you uh, uh, use this criteria while deciding admission for community acquired pneumonia in your setting sir absolutely uh, curb 65 is no doubt a time tested criteria uh, not only i think in uh, rural urban all uh, irrespective of where we are practicing curb 65 gives us a proper guideline whether uh, what what care should be this patient should be offered to like uh, indoor or outpatient care but i would say whatever patients which we see in a public sector uh, such a crowded hospital like nayar ke em sign uh, in mumbai here uh, apart from curb 65 nowadays we are also seeing people who are having comorbidities below 65 years of age as well irrespective of curb so these patients although they may be uh, looking hemodynamically stable at presentation but duration of illness and presence of comorbidities yes we do give them an option that it would be advisable that you get admitted irrespective of bed availability or that we will that we tend to uh, means those those things they do administratively being taken care of but yes uh, i would say ki comorbidities irrespective of curb 65 and duration of illness uh, warrants an admission rather than outpatient treatment so dr vijay if you would just want to conclude or uh, yeah. add anything extra yeah i think basically pneumonia can come for anyone Uh, not necessarily for people who have risk factors so those who don't have any risk factors those who don't have any comorbidities it is a very clear cut case uh, and if the pneumonia is there we treat them outpatient 
But if they have risk factors or if they have comorbidities, that is where we use this confusion, urea, respiratory rate and blood pressure uh, and age 65 rule and then decide whether to admit or not to admit. And this CURB 65 has been very useful, very helpful. Uh, in the last 40 years of my practice, uh, I have been using this and uh, that formula never failed actually. So it is a very reliable one. Uh, of course, there is another more exhaustive uh, index called the pneumonia severity index. Yeah. But this is uh, like a bedside one. The, the hmm. only blood test is the urea. And if the urea is more, blood urea nitrogen, if it is more than 20, then um, it means that the patient uh, is very sick. He has to be admitted. Because this is one of the questions for the young doctors who are presenting the cases. Uh, the first question the family will be asking is, doctor, is this pneumonia very serious? So you go through this CURB 65 and then tell the patient and the family that uh, whether it is serious or not. So it is very useful for uh, communicating with the family, explaining to the family, prognosticating, etc. Apart from to decide whether to hospitalize or not to hospitalize. Okay, so if I might summarize, uh, so the take-home point is, number one, look at the comorbidities, risk factors. Number two, look at the hemodynamic status. And uh, number three, if you're in private sector and if you're deciding to treat, uh, you know, you also have to take into account whether the patient will follow up, is, uh, you know, educated enough uh, to recognize the warning signs. So this guide uh, has to be used by all of us. And of course, CURB 65 has been the time-tested uh, criteria. Uh, it also is useful medical legally. Uh, I would say because it, it, it you know it, it's a legitimate uh, guide to decide uh, outpatient versus inpatient management. So this would be the uh, take home uh, uh, message with regards to. I would like to uh, add one. I would like to add one yeah, sure. point to Dr. Vijay sir. Whatever he has said, uh, I would uh, again I means uh, it's it's very good. Sir has uh, put forth about PSI as well because uh, see we do correct even MD papers and theory papers for uh, our MD students. And students who do not mention PSI in their answers, they tend to score a <laughs> bit less as compared to... So it is definitely both curve as well as PSI. So uh, that, is, that, right. is, uh, that is true. I get more marks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So, so pneumonia severity index is also the exhaustive uh, criteria which uh, has to be kept in uh, handy. So yes. moving ahead, Dr. Uh, Apurva. Yes, sir. So, so we are going to... We have discussed this risk stratification. So our patient falls into uh, number one. Uh, the total score is number Minus. one. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. Okay. So coming to the next question, what investigations have to be done from the outpatient? Okay. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, I would want opinion of uh, both our uh, panelists. Uh, so, Doctor. Uh, uh, Shah, uh, if you could uh, uh, you know, elaborate on this. So, what all investigations do you uh, routinely use uh, in if a patient is uh, diagnosed as CAP uh, to a uh, you know, narrow down your diagnosis, uh, etiological diagnosis, and number two uh, to stratify again, like you know uh, whether it's multi-organ involvement or not. Uh, so, we would like your perspective, and then uh, 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 yeah, we would uh, take Dr. Akesh sir's opinion as well. So, yeah. Dr. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we've already discussed that the X-ray would be the first way to go. And uh, a lot of time based on the X-ray, we do tend to judge the etiology also, whether we are looking towards a viral versus a bacterial. And once the bacterial, whether you're looking more of towards the atypical pathogens or usually the conventional uh, bacterial pathogens. So the X-ray would definitely give us some idea over there. If it's an individual with not uh, significant comorbidities, the investigations which would normally be run by me on an outpatient basis, the blood work would include uh, uh, a blood count and a CRP just to judge at the baseline level of the CRP. Uh, but if there is an individual who with has uh, background comorbidities or if I find this in, uh, any other features which are not typically manage, uh, matching only the localized signs, then we run also a creatinine, a BUN, and uh, electrolytes, just especially in the higher side of the age, because these patients a lot of times have a little bit of diselectrolytemia, which is missed sometimes if you're not running this test. In your so these are the typical blood work. Okay. Uh, 
Regarding the etiology, if we are dealing with typically a community-acquired pathogen, uh, more often, and studies have also shown that even if you get the etiological diagnosis, the empirical therapy most often than not would cover them. So, uh, harping on the etiology right away, especially in these relatively mild pneumonias, may not really be required. But yes, if there is a background uh, structural lung disease or uh, other comorbidities like a heavy diabetic where you want to rule out uh, whether you're dealing with a gram-negative bug or something, then of course a sputum test to find out the cultures and uh, to see what bug is going. And of course the TB is always omnipotent, so it's always there. So you always would have a suspicion on TB. Whenever you're suspecting, you would want to rule out TB on sputum examination. So, uh, if I'm uh, uh, if I'm correct, so what you uh, emphasize is that if your patient is an elderly having a lot of comorbidities, you would run a for detailed uh, test yes. just to rule out your multi-organ uh, involvement, yes. along with uh, uh, emphasis on uh, etiology as well. Yes. And if it otherwise, uh, if it's a young patient, uh, relatively mild uh, symptoms, you would just go ahead with a routine blood count and CRP. Yes, is that right? Okay. Yes. And I, I want to, uh, uh, I mean, I'll just take Dr. Rakesh's opinion and I will get back to you. So, Dr. Rakesh, uh, uh, same question to you. Uh, what would you do typically if a patient comes uh, in OPD and what battery of tests would you advise? Uh, I totally agree with Dr. Shah. And uh, uh, patients who are uh, symptomatically fit or they don't fall into curve uh, 65 criteria, a simple X-ray chest. Uh, sputum examination, CRP and CBC is uh, what uh, we do here. And uh, uh, suppose those patients are having some comorbidities, then targeted uh, blood uh, targeted investigations in the form of sugars, or if there is any other uh, illnesses, then to just to see whether those parameters are under check or not under check, or they may be a reason to flare in. Uh, on treatment as well. So those tests are then carried out. Otherwise, uh, whatever Dr. Shah said, I would agree with that. Okay. So one, uh, 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 the, if you see the slide, uh, and also currently there is a lot of emphasis uh, on, you know, this multiplex PCR on lower respiratory tract samples, which is uh, being advocated and used left, right and center, especially uh, uh, I would say uh, if the patient is affording because those tests are costly. So uh, would you use them uh, in an outpatient setting just to be sure or uh, would you rather reserve it for uh, inpatient severe category? I mean, I know you work in a public sector. so We don't have this luxury of ordering exactly. a flex uh, PCR for everyone. However, we do these tests only for those who are admitted and admitted in an ICU rather than an uh, indoor ward. Okay. So, these tests are uh, specifically, we do reserve it for uh, critically ill patients uh, with LRTI, with respiratory, uh, means, uh, respiratory failures, requiring uh, respiratory supports. Uh, otherwise, uh, because of cost okay. constraints, yeah. we uh, generally don't do these tests. We more, are, yeah, we more rely on even gram stain and sputum examination. That's Absolutely. So, Dr. Mayul, uh, I think you second that as well. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in uh, a lot of physicians who have been also using this multiplex uh, in their patients, but subsequently we see by the, by the time uh, the report comes in, more often than not, the bugs which grow are the ones which have already been covered. So it has right. not, more often than not, it's not really changed the management. True. So Dr. Vijay, I would just want to uh, quickly yeah. ask you one question. Yeah. Suppose if you are suspecting um, viral... We have uh, community acquired pneumonia guidelines being published uh, on and off. Initially, American Thoracic Society published almost 13 years ago. Um, and uh, IDSA also published their own guidelines. But then of late, recently, both the societies have decided that they should together publish uh, a uniform guidelines. So about three years ago, we have the latest community acquired pneumonia guidelines by ATS as well as IDSA. And they very clearly say, since we are talking about the outpatient pneumonia, no need for uh, gram stain or sputum culture for the outpatient pneumonias. It is reserved only for severe cases of pneumonia. Those who are hospitalized or those who are going on a ventilator or those who have severe uh, bugs, etc. So mm -hmm. it is important for us to 
first define whether we are dealing with a severe pneumonia or a non severe pneumonia that is very important again of course uh, we have again criteria for that major criteria and minor criteria we'll come to that when the yeah, i think uh, our purview is more of a cap in outpatient setting so we would like to limit Correct. our discussion to that uh, just one last quick point uh, uh, if you are suspecting viral influenza or uh, covid so would you in the current scenario also recommend testing that in an outpatient setting or even uh, uh, you know if it's mild you would just uh, rather because that has implication in treatment you know you cannot give antibiotics to such patients so what 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 is your take on that sir um so these guidelines discuss elaborately that if you do a gram stain and a culture of the mm-hmm. sputum and also a blood culture we can definitely isolate an organism we can narrow down the antibiotic and we can prognosticate we don't have to use antibiotics unnecessarily etc but the guidelines argue that there is no evidence for that and okay. reg- even if you start an empiric antibiotic uh, the outcomes are the same and that's the reason why for lack of evidence they say uh, don't do gram stain don't do sputum culture don't do blood culture for the outpatient pneumonias Okay. Okay. Doctor, if you want, if you could move ahead. Yes, sir. So, uh, Indian guidelines are available, and the treatment guidelines will be discussed in the further sessions of webinar. I'll just move forward. So, uh, what is the difference between uh, community acquired pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia? Okay. So, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Shah, if you could just uh, quickly uh, summarize this, uh, we. we just have one more case uh, so we are already halfway past so your take on this uh, cap versus app straight forward uh, question uh, but just so for the just for the post graduation yeah so the there's a name suggests the community acquired pneumonia would be the presence of the bug being picked up in the community settings and uh, typically hospital acquired pneumonia would be an infection acquired in the hospital but technically 48 hours post hospitalization so yeah. that's where the hospital acquired pneumonia so earlier there were these terms of healthcare associated pneumonia everything has now been clubbed as hospital acquired pneumonia and that's the synonymous term now been using so post 48 hours hospitalization and then you acquire pneumonia would probably be acquired as a hospital acquired pneumonia no, and then no, yeah. then then becomes the the other setting is a ventilator associated pneumonia and the same criteria the post 48 hours on a ventilator if you acquired pneumonia then again it comes into a vac So I think yeah. that three terms would be cap, hap, and wap. This is the more important. Uh, yeah, to be simplified. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So clear cut. Uh, hospital acquired in hospital after forty eight hours of hospitalization, and usually they tend to be, you know, difficult bugs to treat. Yeah. Okay. So Doctor Apurva. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. so this is very important is, question. Yeah. What is the etiology of cap? So uh, again, uh, Doctor Rakesh. Uh, uh, i would just want to tweak this question a bit uh, apart from what is the etiology uh, do you feel that if you can put some history uh, which would correlate with these three boxes so uh, for the understanding of post graduate so what history uh, favors bacterial viral and uh, less common causes like uh, you know pseudomonas and all so dr akesh uh, if you could just uh, quickly uh, highlight the causes yes. and uh, bac- bacterial generally have a course of illness so they will be somewhere between uh, a week or uh, like that of presentation viral they are more uh, commoner or more frequent in presentations and uh, less commoner ex- uh, like pseudomonas and all uh, these are generally seen with comorbidities to be in simple terms yeah so uh, let us not complicate up much, much but for pgs uh, duration some amount of duration favors uh, bacterial a uh, faster presentation is generally viral whereas uh, comorbidities will give uh, organisms like pseudomonas klebsiella and uh, other organisms just uh, i want to add uh, that is very well simplified uh, so if, if when you have a lot of structural lung diseases like bronchitis right. yes. and post tuberculosis yes. sequela you would tend to have this less common organism less because they tend right. to colonize Right. viral would have some form of coryzal symptoms like upper respiratory prior to presentation and bacterial as you very well said uh, will be very short lived okay yes. okay so 
डॉक्टर अपूर्वा यू हैव एनी मोर स्लाइड स्लाइड्स और वी मूव टू नेक्स्ट केस नेक्स्ट ओके 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 सो थैंक यू डॉक्टर अपूर्वा वेरी वेल प्रेजेंटेड एंड वेरी वेल द क्वेश्चंस वर वेरी पर्टिन टू द डिस्कशन सो वी मूव आई टू द नेक्स्ट केस डॉक्टर तानिया वुड बी प्रेजेंटिंग द नेक्स्ट केस सो वी हैव सम क्वेश्चंस इन द चैट बॉक्स रिगार्डिंग ट्रीटमेंट so i think uh, that is not the purview of this uh, topic we have more of diagnostic aspects so we will have further lectures uh, covering the treatment uh, so in the interest of time i would start the next case so yeah dr tanya you could uh, start your case uh, good evening everyone uh, this is a case of a 67 year old female who had a bmi of 32 she presented with chief complaints of high grade fever cough with scanty sputum expectoration and uh, she also had some symptoms of upper respiratory tract involvement which uh, were a runny nose and throaty she did not report shortness of breath she was a diabetic on oral hypoglycemic agents she gave history of being a ex smoker with occasional alcohol intake she was a housewife and had a recent travel history outside the country on examination she was looking mildly sick she was coughing frequently it was mostly dry cough she was febrile a pulse of 110 per minute oxygen saturation of 94% on room air blood pressure of 130 by 90 mm of mercury and she was tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 32 per minute the throat was congested the tongue was dry and on auscultation she had occasional ronchi this was her chest radiograph at presentation so yeah uh, uh, we just describe this excellent uh, dr so Bhane. right uh, yes yeah, so so, so uh, there were opacity there was there was a, a cavity getting uh, consolidation uh, on the right side in the right lower zone okay and, um, so so okay so can you just uh, take the next slide okay so, so now coming to the question uh, so i would just like to summarize this is a elderly uh, female who has a recent travel history she is diabetic and an ex smoker and is obese and she is presented with a short history again uh, but also has running nose Uh, with sore throat uh, so there is something to suggest a viral uh, prodrome as well and she has presented uh, in a uh, condition of uh, tachycardia and tachypnea with high grade fever with a congested throat and surprisingly the x ray uh, it seems that there is a uh, consolidation with a cavity in the uh, right lower zone so uh, so again i would uh, start with dr uh, shah Uh, so sir how would you uh, distinguish clinically as uh, as well as radiologically or any other test uh, that this cap which has been presented to the opd is of bacterial or viral origin we already have discussed this but uh, i would your, want your uh, quick take on this sir so if we right now take the x ray out of the equation for yeah. now uh, yeah. the way the presentation a couple of points that uh, uh, relatively short history history of travel and a viral prodrome uh and no, not so localized findings uh would probably make this patient go exactly the other way and go more in favor of a viral etiology over here so the exactly what we discussed in the previous case where we had a yeah. localized things. so that's why it would over now only thing the x ray comes into the picture and that's where the other possibilities come into the picture where there was probably a viral infection to begin with and or we are seeing a post viral an associated bacterial pneumonia or a super added bacterial pneumonia that's one possibility or this lady already had a pre existing cavity which is not really the presentation right now so he she had a pre existing cavity which also needs to be worked up but probably right now the presentation is more of a viral with probably a super added bacterial infection and that cavity needs a work up further absolutely spot on yeah so you have discussed all the three uh, things so important for pgs so she is a diabetic okay number 1 and she is obese so she could have number one possibility uh, that this x ray is going against the typical clinical history so that x ray if you take out of the equation it looks like a viral but if you take the x ray into equation it could be two possibilities one whether there is some pneumococcal or like you know post viral uh, staphylococcal infections are very common which do tend to cavitate as uh, dr mehul chaw was saying and second uh, she is diabetic so tb might not be with the typical symptoms as we all see so they have a, have a lower zone predominance as well in tb so there could be a pre existing tb but just now it has got highlighted because of the viral pneumonia uh, which she has got so that is again emphasizes that you should do an x ray in all cases even if it's an outpatient setting that is correct 
So very important uh, uh, learning point. So you can move at time. Okay. So again, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rakesh, if you could answer this question, uh, any direct questioning which uh, you use in your OPD to uh, you know distinguish between bacterial and viral. Again, a recap of our discussion, but uh, just for our PGs, if you could emphasize like this is surely bacterial and this is mostly viral. In, uh, bacterial versus viral as that uh, slide has already been uh, very nicely uh, shown. Hemodynamics and respiratory examination is uh, most of the time it gives a very near clue that yes, this is viral or bacterial. So deranged hemodynamics goes in favor of more of favor of uh, viral rather than bacterial, whereas uh, uh, a, a relatively stable hemodynamics like tachycardia, more of tachycardia, tachypnea and viral as compared to bacterial will favor uh, viral uh, positives of all respiratory examinations will again favor uh, viral rather than bacterial. So these are really very helpful bedside tests and uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of the times this clinical examination correlates or corroborates with our uh, other laboratory as well as radiological findings. So just to add uh, two, three points to your discussion, sir. Uh, number one, uh, bacterial, as uh, the slide is highlighting you, sometimes if you have a purulent sputum, that might be yes. uh, in favor of bacterial. Right. And uh, with uh, COVID uh, being the current uh, scenario, which the world is encountering, so you will have obviously anosmia, myalgia. Sometimes you might have an happy hypoxia, that your yes. patient is hypoxic but not symptomatic. So that could again give you an idea of COVID. And as you rightly highlighted, that out of proportion symptoms that goes... Uh, more in favor of viral, uh, you know, without any localizing sign. So that is uh, 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 the take of uh, the history. Uh, so Dr. Vijay, if you want to add anything yeah. specific from your practice. Yeah, I just want to add uh, that the context is very important. For example, during the pandemic time, all pneumonias were usually of the COVID-19 variety. And uh, currently now we are going through uh, a epidemic of influenza. So yeah. in these things, I think that is when we have to keep thinking about the viral pneumonias. Uh, but about if there is no influenza outbreak and if there is no pandemic, uh, the cases are very less, then probably we'll think uh, more of bacterial rather than viral. And uh, having said that, usually uh, radiologically virals are bilateral. And uh, everybody has said all the right things about the the differences between the two pneumonias. Very nice. I want to just uh, uh, sir add one more point uh, uh, just for the discussion. So if you have an atypical organism like mycoplasma or chlamydia, I would uh, also keep that these patients usually may not be so symptomatic. Elderly patients having just confusion or diarrhea, you know, uh, altered sensorium. If that is the case, and if an X-ray is sometimes and hyponatremias. So they, they usually just, this uh, legionella can cause hyponatremia. So the patient might just present with a confusion, especially in the elderly patient. And if you do an yes. X-ray, through the pneumonia. And the history of travel substantiates yeah. that. True, true. Travel. So, so even that has to be taken into account. Yeah. Correct. So moving ahead, Dr. Tanya. Okay. So, so, so the next question is uh, how to differentiate between influenza and COVID in today's scenario where we have COVID. That's a very important question you have brought in. Uh, because we still have COVID cases. And if you see the report of last one week, the COVID in India is actually, you know, increasing again. And with the background of influenza, which Dr. Vijay mentioned, uh, is there any uh, way? So, Dr. Mehul, your take on this, uh, how will you clinically sort of uh, differentiate using the epidemiological parameters uh, between the two viruses? Clinically, uh However, said and done, it's very, very difficult because most of the symptoms are very, very classical. In fact, when we COVID came, with the term which we used to use is influenza-like symptoms. So actually, yeah. the symptoms are actually very similar to both of them. Yeah, Only like sometimes the duration uh, can clinch the diagnosis, the duration of the fever. So where we see influenza, maybe the fever lingering for three or maximum four days. COVID, the fever may be a little prolonged. So that probably helps you to take a call on uh, that this could be COVID. But uh, or the again, saturation can go low in both of them. But COVIDs we've seen desaturating far more, depending on the variant which we are seeing. 
but clinically otherwise that's pretty much about it of course then up come, comes the microbiology which then becomes ma- makes it very simple the nasopharyngeal swab and yeah. the pcr use so that makes it simple but otherwise only clinically difficult to differentiate true just uh, uh, to add to your discussion uh, sometimes in covid you can have loss of taste and loss of smell yes, that yes, could again yes, be a sort absolutely. of peculiar yes. uh, so but it's not a gold standard but uh, just what we have learned from the last two years so uh, very well uh, uh, said so uh, moving ahead dr tanya uh, so sir so next question is when and how do we suspect that there is a co infection uh, viral and bacterial which is probably what Yeah, so very pertinent to the present case i must say uh, since you have told that there was a viral prodrome but x ray showed otherwise which uh, did indicate that there could be a superadded bacteria so dr rakesh uh, if uh, you could take this question when would you suspect a co infection and also i would want to add why do you feel that there is a co infection is there a link between the two that why co infection can happen the uh, nowadays along with covid we have seen co infections like uh, almost 10 to 15% in uh, many covid patients they do present with co infections as well uh, having said that it is not that the uh, after covid only we are seeing co infections co infections were seen with viral as well as bacterial and uh, this picture was already we were looking into for so many years however the presentations with uh, co infection is a bit more fulminant uh, the characteristic of co infection as you had already said uh, previously is sputum turning into yellowish or yellowish greenish in color ops in amount and sudden deterioration and involvement of other organs as well and of, apart from that uh, a, a more profound and a more rapidly progressing hemodynamic derangements so if these features common features are easily picked up early then i would say ki yes we should suspect uh, co infections so how frequently do you see it sir in your practice like uh, or... uh, yes we have uh, pre- presence of comorbidities uh, alcoholism diabetics uh, re- re- patients on uh, maintenance hemodialysis or on chemotherapeutic agents we have seen patients coming with this and uh, landing up with co infections i would say in our hospital uh, almost around 7 to uh, i would say 7 to 14% we do see co infection sometimes okay so uh, dr mayul i would just want your opinion uh, regarding this as well that uh, uh, how frequently do you see co infection in your practice because you sort of practice slightly in a different setting number 2 is that uh, how far would you go in investigating or confirming or when would you say I want to investigate that there could be superadded infection or there could be some other etiology as well like is there any uh, specific uh, parameter like uh, one could be uh, background comorbidities or not responding or what what points you towards investigating a co infection so the first point that uh, the presence of a co infection uh, we do see it uh, quite often now and in fact the current strain uh, the influenza we seeing a lot of post influenza pneumonias or post influenza yeah. bacterial infection somehow it's very very common this time and in this is usually the pattern which we are seeing so it's if we can really call it co infection or it's a infection with influenza to begin with but then manifests as actually a bacterial infection and predominantly the patient comes in with a bacterial infection but the prodrome was typically viral so this is usually the most common picture which we are currently seeing on an outpatient as well as a lot of time is in an inpatient pa- uh, patients also the second part uh, how much we would investigate to find this uh, it would really matter if the presentation especially in a hospitalized patient is very unusual and it's just the rapidity of the presentation which is there or in an outpatient basis if you have already been seeing in the in the first 5 or 7 days where you would still have a window to add a uh, an oseltamivir or something to consider if you find a co infection whether giving an antiviral would actually help uh, decrease the severity of the current infections but otherwise if it's post 7 days even if it's a viral prodrome to begin with but post 7 days where you're dealing with a picture now which is resembling more of a bacterial pneumonia i would still say this is a post viral pneumonia and manages like a bacterial pneumonia Yeah, Dr. Tanya. 
So the next question is uh, put into the current scenario. Uh, can a patient have dual viral infections and how does it affect uh, the outcomes? Okay. So again, uh, I would start with uh, Dr. Rakesh. So dual, so we saw bacterial plus virus, now virus plus virus. So, uh, so well, number one, I would want to put this question in a different way. Like if you are suspecting or if you're having a patient who's presenting with a viral like uh, history, would you advise an RT-PCR which would test both an H1N1, H3N2, influenza B and COVID-19? So what is your take on this considering the current scenario? Or you would just uh, narrow down to one considering cost is an issue or resources are an issue? Yesterday only I had seen such a patient at Kasturba Hospital. She is a pregnant female. Uh, we suspected H3 uh, uh, influenza, but uh, her COVID came positive. Okay, that is. So uh, this is now present, and we have to accept it. Uh, when we send the battery of test, we have to consider both influenza as well as COVID now. Okay. So, Doctor Mayul, just your take because you work in a private sector, so cost is definitely a constraint in most of your patients. I assume. So, um, uh, how would you, uh, you go about, and uh, would your patients get convinced to send both of these? No, I second what Dr. Rakesh said. We, if at all we are sending a swab, it has to include now both the influenza as well as the COVID. It's, I mean, yeah. if the symptoms are similar and there's no way you can differentiate. This is the only way you will be able to differentiate. So, yes. And the other important, uh, I would just want to add is that you have treatment for uh, influenza. You have a definite treatment. And yes. there is evidence that if you give Oseltamavir in the window period, yes. your patient will have a, a proper outcome. I mean, there is definite evidence for that. Dr. Vijay, or just any comment? Yeah, I think this is a theoretical possibility that uh, during pandemic, if there is an influenza outbreak, a patient can have COVID as well as influenza. Um, but then they are, they are very less in number. Um, so do you frequently advise both the tests together if you are suspecting viral or you just... Uh... Yeah, depends uh, if they are aged, um, elderly, and if they have comorbidities and if the symptoms, instead of uh, showing a defervescence, uh, if the symptoms persist, then of course it is a red flag. So okay. I would like to go ahead and then do the influenza panel as well as the COVID-19 throat swab. So, but first you would uh, start with one, that is what you're saying? That you would... Yes. Start? Yes. Okay. And yes. if that comes negative, would you straight away send the second or wait again? I mean... What is your take? Yeah, I mean, no, in in these uh, scenarios where the patient is elderly, mm -hmm. having comorbidities, and the patient is very sick, not improving even on day two, then I would send both the investigations, both for COVID-19 as well as for influenza. Okay, okay. okay. And uh, regarding severity, uh, uh, Dr. Tanya, if you could just uh, highlight uh, whether there is any correlation between the two. So as you can see in your slide that uh, co-infections have an increased risk of ICU admission, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, with comorbidities, uh, it's associated with yeah. higher okay. that. Okay. okay. Next. So how do we investigate for viral pneumonia? Okay. So another uh, important question because uh, uh, not uh, everywhere do you have resources for testing viruses, especially this uh, uh, might be a problem in rural and uh, tired two and three setting, but uh, obviously with the advent of RT PCR, I think uh, this is not the case. But again, I would like the opinion of all the panelists. So, uh, Doctor Rakesh, to start with, how would you yeah, investigate a viral uh, uh, apart from the swabs which we send? Do you have anything? Uh, CTs CTs have turned out to be really helpful. Uh, uh, apart from swabs, of course, swabs are a definitive treatment, no doubt about it. But add-on, I would say uh, viral pneumonitis are very nicely seen. We had conducted a very good study here and it has given very positive results as uh, a plain CT scan of chest has been really helpful uh, in adding on uh, whether it is uh, viral or bacterial uh, pneumonia. Could you, could you please elaborate or clarify, like if you are sending a swab and if you get a positive report, uh, so would you still go ahead with a CT? No, or no, 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 not, not that way, not that way. Okay, so okay. Sending a swab and getting a report takes at least 24-48 hours in a public sector. 
Okay. So till that time, I am saying that this can be an add-on test. That's all. And I, I am not uh, substituting swap for CT. Okay, but uh, uh, considering cost as an uh, factor, uh, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know uh, if you do a CT and wait uh, before you get the results. Uh, it might add to the cost. Uh, that is what I feel. Uh, uh, in a government setup, the <laughs> CT scan uh, you have have a cost you. issue. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Mehul, if what's your take on this? So, apart from the swab, uh, Dr. Ake said uh, CT. Uh, I absolutely agree with him that it can give you a, a, a very good idea of whether it's viral or uh, lobar or bacterial pneumonia. But in your setting, what would you do apart from a swab? Like uh, you have sent the swabs. Obviously, there is a waiting period of 24 to 48 hours, even in the private, I assume. So what would you uh, do in the meantime uh, in terms of investigations? So assuming that the swab has been sent and we are waiting upon it and of course yeah. bloods also will be important. Again, as we've seen a lot of times in COVID also, so electrolytes and a lot of other parameters get it in. So the blood work, routine blood work, routine biochemistry and everything. Uh, X-rays also sometimes turn out to be helpful over here. Uh, we may not always push for a CD unless the swab is negative or we are waiting for the swab, but the condition of the patient merits that we are still in the window period and we do want to take a call on starting an antiviral, then maybe not wait for the swab, get a scan done or something which tells us this is not bacterial, this is no other alternative diagnosis is there yeah. and it is pretty much in pretty much viral, viral. then would we'll start uh, the antiviral rather than wait for the swab or wait for the uh, results to come in. Because we don't want to miss out on the window period. The earlier we start, the better. Okay. And also probably blood workup like lymphocytosis yes, yes. or can, you know, a relative sure. leukopenia can probably... So whatever helps us, tell us it's not... Other inflammatory markers. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. I would just want to add one more or ask you guys uh, how uh, frequently or how do you use procalcitonin as a guide uh, to differentiate between the two? Uh, what's your take, Dr. Rakesh, on this? Uh, See, uh, procalcitonin will not, uh, it, 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 is, it will help, but it will just differentiate between bacterial or non-bacterial. Yeah. So, so that will not rule out that this is viral or not viral. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I mean, just another ancillary or you know, supportive uh, evidence. I, uh, do see, you, the cost your of decisions the, are based on that or no? I'm just trying to understand that. Yes, yes. We do. Uh, it, it will be a helpful test, but not a mandatory test. Okay. Do, Dr. Mehul, uh, do you want to add or uh, you know, modify anything in that? So you use procalcitonin? You, procalcitonin in some patients where we are a little confused where there's not a classical history, but otherwise the CRPs also actually have correlated pretty yes. closely with procalcitonin in most of the patients. And the advantage is cheaper tests and uh, we can follow up the CRPs uh, periodically. Procalcitonin repeating them also becomes difficult. So if at all we want a marker which we want to keep tracking, CRP turns out to be better. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Vijay, uh, your take on this? Yeah. Or? yeah. I think procalcitonin has been referred uh, in context of uh, community acquired pneumonias uh, and it does not differentiate between the viral and the bacterial and uh, the ATS guideline says start empirical antibiotics regardless of the procalcitonin levels. Yeah, no, no, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, this question was in the context that what if you are suspecting a viral pneumonia, you are sent a swab. So, any other test apart from... Uh, uh, swabs, would you recommend or would you like to investigate just to be sure yeah. uh, that uh, you know you are dealing I with think, the virus? I think I will go with the very basic uh, WBC count. Yeah, so uh, leukopenia and lymphocytosis yes. probably yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, favor your viral etiology. Yes. Okay, true. Yeah, Dr. Tanya, you can continue. This is the last question. So, uh, should this patient be admitted in the hospital? So I would want your take, Dr. Tanya. What do you feel? Your this patient uh, has presented to you. Would you admit this patient? And then we can move on to the panelists. So, so the score is two. So uh, yeah. yes, so because very, of comorbidity is and uh, yeah. so the this presentation patient, uh, and, has a yes, curve score. And the is two. Yes. Yeah. So curve score and is and the X-ray as well. The, very the important. Chest radiograph, which, yeah. So, so we yes. don't know what I this do. patient is actually actually having, and so. Uh, I also feel that this patient should be uh, admitted. Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Mehul, what's your take? Uh, would you admit this patient in the hospital, considering the scenario and the X-ray and uh, the general condition? Uh, 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, this 94% is also a very tight walk on the rope. So we have to be very, very careful. So which side it flips over and uh, the patients are not uh, due diligent. So I would rather err on the, this is observed in the hospital rather than relying only on the patient to give us a status over next 24 to 48 hours. Dr. Rakesh, your I totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. Needs admission, no doubt about it. Dr. Vijay, your take, sir. Yeah, this, this this patient is walking on the thin ice. She is 67 years and respiratory rate is high and the saturation is just falling down. Uh, and uh, X-ray definitely shows a cavitary lesion. Uh, so she needs more investigations. She needs more observation. Um, and she has to be hospitalized. So, so we are all on the same page. Uh, so I think it was a fruitful discussion. I just have two questions uh, from the audience before we, uh, I mean, these are not in the context of the current. Uh, Dr. Tanya, you don't have any more slides, right? No, sir. This is yeah. Okay. So uh, just uh, I would uh, want uh, these questions to be taken. So uh, one question is uh, empirical, so it's out of context, but still. Empirical antibiotic choice in emergency settings, if your patient of CAP comes to the emergency and uh, choice of oxygen, I mean, uh, how would you guide oxygen therapy? So uh, if uh, Dr. Mayul, you could uh, take this question. So choice of uh, empirical antibiotics, especially in emergency settings, if a uh, patient is having CAP, what would you start? So so suppose one the, case number one. The slides which uh, we, uh, oh, so the case number one we're talking about. Yeah, so so, in a patient who would probably be criteria wise would be a probably a mild pneumonia, would start with a beta lactam with a beta lactamase inhibitor. So, most commonly we are using amoxiclide. Uh, I think if he had comorbidities, then would also add uh, a microlide uh, along with that. And that is what usually the guidelines also recommend. So, healthy individual, no comorbidities, less than 65, only a, a beta lactam with a lactamase inhibitor. If with 65 plus or comorbidities, Along with that, adding a macrolide would be the way to go. So, Dr. Rakesh, of course, uh, if, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. We follow the same. We follow the yes. same in our EMS. And uh, oxygenation wise, first we will just go ahead with uh, nasal oxygen and observe his saturations. And if he settles down, then nothing like that. As and when need is uh, uh, increases, then other modalities of oxygenation can be considered. True. Uh, so, Dr. Vijay, if you would add anything. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we are talking about the outpatient setting. Yeah. So where uh, so, there is no so just the context oxygen. of this question was if yeah. the patient is coming to so emergency. If at all, the, if at all the patient is admitted and requires oxygen, of course we go by the pulse oximeter, and we try to keep the oximetry about ninety two percent, whatever it takes, whether it is one liter, two liters, three liters, the nasal prongs, and uh, of course. Um, if the patient becomes more hypoxic, of course, it's a different story. Uh, it's not part of the discussion. Yeah. So just uh, I would want to, uh, I mean, I uh, second all of you, but uh, just to emphasize the point uh, which we uh, do uh, uh, tell to all our PG students that avoid quinolones, even though the guidelines uh, yes. say that quinolones can be given. But in our setting, uh, TB is a very important consideration. And uh, so quinolones have to be avoided as much as possible. Unless the guidelines say that, uh, you know, Indian guidelines also say, send a sputum AFB and confirm that, uh, you know, you are not dealing with TB. So that is uh, there. And uh, one last question. Uh, if the, your patient deteriorates or there is no radiological improvement, uh, what would be the choice of your antibiotics? Uh, sir, if you could take this question. Uh, I didn't get the question. Uh, there was the some question was break. that uh, if suppose your patient uh, doesn't have a radiological improvement, there is nothing mentioned extra. So I assume that there is no clinical improvement as well. So what would you do? And second, I would want to add that uh, if there is no radiological improvement, but just uh, clinically the patient is doing good, would you change your antibiotics? So both yeah. from PG point of view. While, while treating a patient of community acquired pneumonia, uh, clinical improvement takes uh, importance. Yeah. So if the patient is improving clinically, uh, the fever has disappeared, cough has come down, and WBC count is coming down, and patient uh, visibly is looking better, improved appetite, etc. That is more important because radiological improvements always lag. 
uh, it takes some time. And that's the reason why American Thoracic Society says you don't have to really repeat a chest X-ray if the patient is improving uh, in an mm-hmm. outpatient setting. True, true, true. Absolutely. So I would uh, just uh, uh, tell the PG student who has asked this question, radiology always follows clinical uh, uh, context, not uh, the other way around. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are done with all the questions as well. Uh, I would want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizers and Dr. Talwar sir for giving all of us this uh, platform and opportunity to discuss a very important topic. And I, I would like to thank uh, my esteemed chairperson, Dr. Vijay sir, uh, the clinical discussants, Dr. Mehul and Dr. Rakesh sir for uh, being very lucid, very precise in their explanation and giving us the overview of both the public as well as the private sector. And uh, to our PG students, Dr. Apurva and Dr. Tanya, you guys uh, presented very well. Uh, the case, the flow of the case was uh, very pertinent, I would say, to the current scenario and to the commonly encountered clinical uh, problems in uh, outpatient settings with respect to CAP. Uh, so I would want to just thank. So last uh, closing statements by all of you, sir, to start with you. Uh, yeah, I think it has been a wonderful uh, review of uh, community acquired pneumonia, especially the diagnostic part in the outpatient settings. So we have emphasized that clinical clinical uh, profile is very important for the patient. And uh, American Thoracic Society, again to quote, uh, after having looked at all the randomized clinical trials, it says ultimately your clinical judgment is important. Uh, mm. It is not the investigation. Your clinical judgment and the more cases of community acquired pneumonia you see, the more experience you gain, and uh, you will be able to judge better uh, using the tools like CURB 65 and uh, pneumonia severity index. And two things stand out, or three things stand out. Is, number one is the age, number two are the comorbidities, and uh, number three, of course, are the risk factors to define whether it is a non-severe or a severe pneumonia. Thank you. Dr. Mayul, your closing comments or any suggestions? I exactly echo what Sir said. And uh, just uh, think that for all of us, and including the postgraduate students, so the idea is to pick up a pneumonia. And current pandemic setting, even more important to differentiate between the viral. So A, you have to pick up a pneumonia. B, you have to quickly differentiate between bacteria and viral. And initiate treatment early. The faster we do this, the lesser the hospitalizations eventually. And that data has mm-hmm. very clearly shown that. Thank you. Dr. Rakesh, uh, any, any comments? Yes, uh, uh, other speakers have already covered most of the topics and I totally agree with them. Uh, clinical examination and early identification, I think, should be the take-home message for uh, everyone uh, regarding treatment of community according to them. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I think I'll hand over to the organizers now uh, for any... Uh... I take this opportunity to thank all who have joined this webinar, which is EPICS for Physicians and Respiratory Physicians, combined under the ages of Indian Chess Society and Association Physicians of India. I hope you liked it. Do get the feedback to us and we will try to definitely incorporate them in the future series. So keep tuned and watch each and every episode and give your feedback to us. Thank you very much.